Justice League The New Frontier is the first ever animated Justice League movie. And I gotta say, it's an incredible initial impression. Which just goes to show you that first isn't always the worst. The movie is based on a comic series of a very similar name. The designs and depictions of characters are very much on brand with their Golden Age comic counterparts. While matching the aesthetic of the Golden Age heroes in terms of attire, the animation style still feels very reminiscent of the DC Animated Universe's designs. And that's probably because this had a lot of the same people working on it. Or one specifically. Being as this is a love letter to the heroes of yesterday, this movie is set in the 1950s. And it doesn't shy away from delving into deeper topics. The movie does a good job of properly portraying these early versions of these iconic characters, but it does so in a very interesting way. Because not only are these interpretations true to their original counterparts, looking and acting like the characters from those early comics, but the story fleshes them out and makes them feel more like people than powers. You see, in the early days of comics, these characters were commodities not for who they were, but for what they could do. Their superhuman abilities and capabilities fueled their early stories, as that's what made them unique and creative at the time. On top of that, in their infancy, these characters were made for children, so they didn't always deal with adult issues. And if and when they did, they typically did so with kid gloves. But this project takes the characters from that day and exposes them to the issues from that day and issues people like them probably would have faced had they existed during the times of their creation. It's centered around the political landscape of the time, and deals with themes such as alienation and prejudice, not brought on by hatred, but rather by fear. It also shows these heroes' struggles, and them doing what's right, even if it's not always agreed upon by their peers about what is right in every given situation. It does justice to the Justice League, and adds a depth to the early iterations of these characters that wasn't present otherwise. What I love most about this is that it showed that even in their early years, these characters were capable of being in complex stories with little to no alterations. Without a need for modernizing these characters, without a lot of progress and development they've made over media. Which is definitely not something I would have thought otherwise. If you would have asked me prior to watching this if Golden Age Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman could tackle somewhat serious issues, I wouldn't have even taken that question seriously. To me, in their incarnations, they were surface-level supers. I'd never expect to see them deal with such depth. We see some of these characters conflicting moral compasses, not allowing their friendships to change or shape their convictions initially. As Wonder Woman liberates a bunch of women who were made prisoner, and used by rebels, not only giving them their freedom, but giving them access to the weapons of their enemies while she looked away. As he sees this action as rogue vigilante justice, Superman understands why she's done what she's done, but still can't help but see this as a reason for concern, and maybe even a betrayal to the oath that she had taken. Back home, Diana's not gaining any popularity either, as her time away from the mascara has led to some of her peers believing she's more American than Amazon almost making her an outsider wherever she goes. But she handles that criticism with all the confidence that you'd expect Wonder Woman to, showing her competition that she's up for the challenge. Martian Manhunter is plucked from his planet and brought to ours, where he lives in hiding, an alien alienated from a society that is alienated by aliens. And yet, incognito, he tries to live amongst them and help them to the best of his abilities, knowing that those around him hate him for merely existing and daring to be different. Even Batman seems to go through a little bit of an identity crisis here, after seeing how much fear his appearance drives into the heart of not only the corrupt, but the innocent as well. Batman adapts a much friendlier looking ensemble. Hal Jordan is considered a coward by his peers for not seeing action during his time in war. But his lack of war stories don't come from a cowardice or inability to kill. They come from his unwillingness to take the lives of those he deemed innocent, as Hal didn't agree with his country's decision to go to war. Despite being out in the trenches, Hal Jordan only winds up taking a life once the war has already ended, and only did so as a means of survival. What is seen as cowardice by his peers is seen as courage by Lantern Corps, and for knowing and appreciating the value of life, he is made a Green Lantern. Costumed heroes, in spite of their selfless heroics, are often treated as less than human, 
The Flash is almost taken in by the government so they can experiment on him and learn how his powers work. So in fear for his family, he retires from the mantle, only to eventually be convinced back into costume by that very same family he swore to protect. The plot centers around an entity known as the Center, a being who has witnessed the birth and evolution of mankind. And after seeing the damage humanity has done not only to the planet, but to their own species, polluting the world with war and violence, it ultimately decides that the human race needs to be eradicated. And it's only after that threat becomes too much to bear that humans and differently powered people can finally put their paranoia and prejudice aside to defeat the common enemy, and ultimately begin to fix human-alien relations. By the end, lessons are learned, characters are developed, and changes are made. In a way, it sort of feels like the characters from the Golden Age transitioning into the characters they later become the Silver Age. There's a lot of strong themes here for a Golden Age story. I also wouldn't expect the adult themes this movie had in store. Sure, it may cut to shadows or use techniques to not show the brutality of certain situations, but even then, that's not always a guarantee. Nonetheless, this gets pretty intense for a JLA story. This was strange to see when I'm so used to seeing the more campy run of these characters. It was surprising, but not completely unwelcome. The movie wasn't excessive in its violence, it never feels like it goes overused. It feels like it was carefully crafted, and the violence was only added in to add to the severity of each moment. The movie also provides some beautiful imagery of these classic comic icons, some of which genuinely look like they could be comic covers of the time. Though granted, considering this is an adaptation, a lot of these moments are pulled directly from actual comic panels. The cast is pretty interesting. There's a lot to talk about on that front. Alan Richson returns to the role of Aquaman, a part he played previously on Smallville, which came as a shock to me, because I remember at the time, despite getting positive reception for his time in the role at first, when Smallville creators wanted to spin off the show and make an Aquaman series, it was thought that his performance wasn't strong enough to carry a show. So to see him used in a major and much more accurate DC production is a little shocking to say the least. Granted, it's a bit part, but still, not the voice I thought I'd hear coming out of that character model. Miguel Ferrer, who played the Weatherman in the Justice League live-action show pilot, and the Weather Wizard in Superman the Animated Series, plays Martian Manhunter here. Which is surprising, because the first time I watched that pilot with friends, I actually said I thought that he would make for a good Martian Manhunter. If I had a nickel for every time I fan-casted the Martian Manhunter character, only for that actor to later play that part in real life, then I'd have four nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened four times, right? And speaking of Martian Manhunter in Smallville, the Martian Manhunter from Smallville, actor Phil Morris, plays the part of King Faraday. He also played Vandal Savage in the Justice League show. Lucy Lawless, who is widely considered to be the greatest Wonder Woman there never was, was in fact Wonder Woman. This has been a fan cast for years prior, and even after this. And Lucy herself has been one of those fans casting. And you know what? She's every bit as good as you'd hope for her to be. She comes across like a strong leader, not shy of making the hard decisions for the betterment of people everywhere. I think her sense of justice here definitely teeters more into the realm of vigilanteism, but not to an extreme, as she treats goodness with good and the wicked with wickedness. You can understand how she could cause problems for the overall view society has on supers, but you can also see her creating solutions for the less fortunate. Neil Patrick Harris plays Barry Allen slash The Flash, joining Josh Keaton, Yuri Lowenthal, and James Arnold Taylor as being a voice actor for both The Flash and Spider-Man. Once again, it's weird that it happened four times, right? To say that he does the job well is a major understatement. He's one of the best performances in the whole movie, providing the voice for a Flash who feels incredibly human. It makes me wonder how he never got the chance to play the part again. It also makes me wonder how this guy played so many characters perfectly, despite never once changing his inflection or cadence. For me personally, though, the greatest performance has to be Kyle MacLachlan, or Kale as he's known in some circles. His performance feels like the perfect hybrid of the Superman from the time and a more modern-day Superman. I think that statement pretty much sums it up, 
I don't really have a whole lot more to say. I'm just surprised by how seamless of a combination this is for him. Jeremy Sisto of Clueless fame plays the Dark Knight, and I don't necessarily love this portrayal generally speaking. If he was playing the part anywhere else, I think his voice sounds a little off, but for this version of the character, I think it works. Additionally, his performance is good. His inflection is actually perfect. He speaks the way Batman speaks to a T. It's just really the matter of his voice itself. But again, that's just a me thing. My man David Boreanaz, the vampire with the soul, plays Green Lantern. And if I'm gonna be honest, I'm really not a fan. Big fan of Boreanaz, but not him as Green Lantern. He seems like a little bit of a miscast here. But also, in general, I don't think he's all that great of a voice actor. He's definitely great in his own right when it comes to on-screen presentation, but when he's just voicing a character, there always seems to be some sort of disconnect. He always feels like he's just reading lines off a piece of paper, rather than articulating and emoting what it is the character's feeling. But my biggest complaint about this movie is the simple fact that it feels too short. Each of these characters really have their own standalone solo story that ties into the greater narrative, and that's great. But perhaps as an effect of that, it means less time is spent with each individual character and their personal plights. So by the end of it, we can understand the narrative, but it hardly feels like we truly get to know the characters. It's impressive that everything in this story is so fluid given how many characters we're following. Characters who paths don't always cross, mind you. Especially when this doesn't take the time to explain all of these characters' dynamics. Just simply dropping the viewer into an already established universe with pre-existing friendships and alliances. By the end of it, I just feel like I didn't see nearly enough of these characters in this time period. And speaking of time periods, the passage of time in this movie feels a bit unclear. I never know if two days, two months, or two years have passed. The transitions could have been done a little bit better. I'll also admit that I think this movie definitely has a much stronger first and second act than it does a third one. It just gets to a point where it's like, oh, you remember the threat? Well, now there's alien dinosaurs also. I wasn't expecting that, and I didn't really love it. But it also doesn't take away from my overall love of the movie. On top of that, I think things get wrapped up a little bit too quickly. We're shown the hostility of humanity at the time, but then, like, superheroes do one good thing, and they're like, all right, water under the bridge, let's just move on. It's just a little too quick for my liking. This was something that needed a steady progression rather than just a total 180 at the end of the end. Although personally, I thought this was a very creative way of paying respect to the past while also telling a story that felt relevant to the present. Keeping the tone of modern stories, but not losing the heart of the classics. Once again, I know that this is done in the comic series that this movie's based on, but it still deserves all the credit in the world there and here. While it does have its shortcomings, as it should being the brand's first major outing, I think there's a lot to love with this film. And it should be seen as one of the greatest Justice League movies ever made. With that being said, if you like this video as much as I liked making it, and you want to see more Justice League content here on the channel, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, We're like the Justice League. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.